quick invite you to stand back up and spread your hands. Alright, we're gonna start with the first word from Psalm 97. This is a uh, kind of a praise of creation. Uh, the Lord reigns, let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all peoples see his glory. Oh, I 
words that we just use that describe motivation, that you can be anywhere you go. Um, we thank you for your love. Um, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Of, of the church, 
Um, Elijah is newer to Fred, but here's some of that, um, that story here today. But um, I am just going to take a brief second and pray before Elijah comes up, and then um, I'm just really grateful that we get to hear his story. Lord God, I thank you so much for the, uh, the colorful tapestry of your family and just all the different um, types of people that you call into connection with you, Lord. And it breaks our hearts that the church has so often um, just wanted kind of a, a, a gray tone. <laughs> um, tapestry where you're all about all the colors and all the variety of the people that you've created and we just ask um, for your blessing on elijah as he shares that this would be a safe place for him to do that i pray that his words would land um, in hearts that need to hear them for courage and uh, strengthening um, and vision for what for what you're um, about and just thank you for his courage to share with us and ask your spirit to be at work um, in him and in, through his words. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, yeah, feel free to just do that. Hi, everyone. Hello, Marty. So I know most of you guys, I'm not sure if you know me. Um, I'm Elijah Parker. I'm 15 years old. I'll be 16 this Friday. So we're excited about that. Um, my mom, Linda Parker, is right over there. Um, we've been attending Threads for a little over a year now. Um, we started last May. Um, and so I'm up here because it is June, and June is Pride Month. And I'm not sure how other people have defined Pride, but Pride isn't Pride to me. Um, it's more just honesty and transparency with those around you. You can be who you were created to be, and be yourself, and be transparent with other people nearby. Um, and so with that out of the way, I'd like to share why I'm even up here. Um, and who is this little 15-year-old, 15-year-old? Why is he speaking? Um, well, last June, I remember Rebecca did a Pride Month series, and various people shared their stories of being LGBTQIA plus in the church and Christian, and I opted out of it because at the time I was only attending for a month then, um, and I was very new. And so when, throughout my entire life, I've always been seen different as people. Um, I really wanted to share my story back then, and I'm, I've read it every day since, so I'm really glad to be up here. Um, throughout my entire life, I've always been seen as different by people. Um, in other churches, in my church's youth groups, and in just on school, online, and just everywhere. Um, although, in my eyes, I'm no different than any other person. Um, and oh, so I've essentially been let down by people so many times, but God has always been there for me throughout all of it. Um, and honestly, He's led me here to friends, and I couldn't ask for anything better. Um, my journey has been interesting, to say the least, but I'm really glad that I'm at the spot that I am right now here at Threads. I consider it a second home, and I'm really glad to call it that. Um, so when my mom and my dad came to Michigan, they started going to our old church in 2003. Um, and so they were very involved in church. My mom did youth ministry there. And we were all, we knew everybody. We'd been there for forever. Um, and then I was later born in 2007, and we did everything. We were so involved in serving. My mom led the, led the kids ministry program for years, and she was very involved in that. My siblings and I did tech crew for our churches and Sunday ministries, and we would run the sound, the audio, the slideshow, everything. Um, my dad was on editorial staff. We were very involved. My mom sang on stage, and it was just, we were all had our hands on in the church. We kept it running smoothly. Um, and so I grew up a bit, and eventually I was in middle school, and I, my siblings always went to their small youth groups when they were in high school, so I figured I might as well do that when I was in middle school so I could hang out with other people my age and kind of connect with them. Um, but they were, I never really connected with those people. Um, I didn't quite fit into the normal middle school boy standard. I wasn't like the same as those were that were around me. Um, they just fit the stereotype. Like I had a different hair kid, I just was different, I wore different clothes. I was just not at all like them. And the girls in the small groups, they just thought I was weird because at the time, I wasn't necessarily out of the closet. I wasn't, I didn't know who I was regarding gender or sexuality or anything. I didn't know who I wanted to be at the time. Um, and eventually, there was one time in our middle school youth group where we played a game, we were playing four square, you know what that is, it's like a weird four bracket thing. Um, but there was me and this other kid who were off the side waiting for something, I don't remember. But I remember one of the kids called me a transgender slur. And for contest, I'm not transgender in any sense. I'm a cisgender man, I identify as LGBTQ, but I'm not transgender. Um, but in the context, 
he said, quote, are you a teaster? You look like one. Are you gay? And he speaks another slur in that context. And in my public middle school, I experienced something like this on the daily, but seeing this in church was not at all how I would have expected that to happen. Um, and it would happen, it happened within, like, the adults weren't there. They never were there to see any of that happen. They never actually saw any of it go down. It was always behind closed doors when they were just to other kids my age. Um, and so it happened at school a lot. And like that's honestly kind of normal for me at the time. It's just it happened to be in school. But and that's sad to say. But to have that happen in church was really shocking. And I hated going to youth group from that point on. I did not like going to my church at that point because I didn't feel as if I could be myself. And I remember I would go home from youth group every Wednesday crying because I couldn't be who I really was designed to be or who I was created to be. And that was really hard. I remember every time we would have a car ride home with my mom from youth group, I would cry because I just, I hated it. I couldn't be myself and I hated being bullied by the kids around me and that was in that stuff for that age. Um, and so I went down and talked to my youth pastor, the one that was leading the teens small groups, and talked to him about what had happened. And he, it did stop for a bit. It, the no kids bullied me for a little, little bit there, but there was still some boundary. And then a few months went by, and it picked up again, and it continued after that. Um, and so I just, I couldn't be myself in youth group, and so I stopped going for quite a while. Um, and it was really, it let me down because the people my age that I thought served God let me down, and I didn't, I would not have expected any of them to call me a slur or anything remotely like that. That it was harmful for me at that age. I probably didn't even know what it meant. I had to go home and search it up at that point, right? I was in middle school. You don't really know what those things are. Um, and so I remember when I was growing up, I would always hear everyone say that church should be a second home for you. It should feel like another place where you can be comfortable and be yourself. But I could never relate to that at that time. Um, my second home was actually my school's theater program, which is very different. Um, but those people in my theater program aren't Christian, and yes, they're great people, but they're not people that I can connect with, and I'm, they're not the same as me in that area. I can't talk to them about my religion or my faith. It was just, it was very different, and I, of course, they're still great people. They supported me throughout everything, but they didn't understand my Christianity and my beliefs in that area. So there was still some kind of boundary there. So throughout my entire young youth life, there's always been some kind of boundary between me and somebody else. So at school, it was the fact that they weren't Christian, or at church, it was the fact that they weren't gay or didn't relate to me in any sense. And I needed a Christian group of people that supported me for me, and I couldn't find that. I never found that in church. Um, and the people my age never made me feel welcome. But yes, I still had my theater friends at that point. Um, and although all, all of that had, had happened, I still had a very strong connection with God at the time. I was like 13, 12, and I still would attend church every Sunday and be myself as much as I could be at the time. But I was trying really hard to keep a strong connection with God. Even if it wasn't what other people would have envisioned for me, I still prayed every night and I would do everything. I would read the Bible. I would keep a connection with him in my own heart. Um, and I knew throughout the slurs and the bullying and all of the good things that happened, I can somehow become who I need to be with God by my side. I can become who I'm designed to be. As long as I'm there and God is there with me, I can be okay. As long as I'm still serving in some capacity, that's okay. I'm all right if I can just do my own thing and keep my faith in strong. As long as I can keep loving the way that he designed me to love other people and not stop that, even throughout all the bullying and what had happened. Um, but at that point, it clicked in my brain. If I did the tech at my church and I served in countless other areas, and I also did theater at my school and everything else, I might as well sing on stage, right? And so I remember um, I talked to my pastor about um, wanting to sing on stage for worship on Sundays. And Hank actually had me sing on our small youth groups um, on for the worship on Wednesdays. And you know, I had so much fun with that. It was a great experience. And so I wanted to be in my church's main worship team. And I talked to Hank about it, and he was completely on board. I loved that. And we were setting it in motion. And so I attended a music rehearsal for our church on Thursday night, and we I got the harmonies down, it was all great, and I loved it. Um, and our head pastor tells my mom that we need to meet afterwards. And so we started off the meeting by saying, by asking, so you want to be in the church's worship team? And of course, at the time I was 13, and I eagerly said yes, because I'm passionate about singing, and I'm passionate about serving God in my area of my life, right? And so then he goes into detail about how there's no audition process. Now we can't just let anyone on stage, and to some extent, excuse me, it's understandable, because honestly, you can't just have anyone on stage, and I get that to some extent, right? But I had sung before, and I sang on Wednesdays with my youth worship team, and 
and I sang in theater and in choir, and I have, I have experience, so that wasn't the issue. Um, and so I finally wanted, the issue was that I wanted to serve in a way that I found possible, but he wouldn't look, look, look past who I am as a person. Um, and then he goes on about my self-expression, how um, in order to serve the Lord, you have to wear something and not be distracting in church. Um, and I personally believe in order to serve the Lord, wear whatever you want. Honestly, I don't care. I'm going to be up here in pink shorts and the light dress shirt. It's fine. <laughs> And so my pastor told me that if I go on stage and sing, I can't wear anything distracting. Um, keep in mind, my pastor would wear neon shoes to serve <laughs> in service. So distracting, okay. And he would wear like flannels and sweatshirts and t-shirts and pastoral clothing. So it wasn't what I was wearing or what he was wearing that was the problem. It was how we were wearing it. And my like my character in that sense. And it wasn't that wasn't the question. It was the fact that I was gay as a middle schooler. And he didn't like that. And so at that point, I knew for a fact he didn't care about what I wore. He cared about how I wore it. Um, I can't even avoid or show any side of my gayness in that area. Um, I have to hide my personality and sexuality as much as I could to be on the worship team. And apparently before any of that had happened, he had gotten complaints by other people in the church about me and about who I am um, and about who I express myself as. And that doesn't seem right to me for people to complain. And so, anyways. Um, it was just the fact that I was existing in church as myself. And at the time, I wasn't even out or overly gay yet. Yeah, I hadn't put any labels on it. I wasn't, I wasn't labeled anything at that time, right? I was still in the closet as a middle schooler, right? Hard enough as it is. <laughs> um, I was still figuring things out myself. But people came forward to him and talked to him about how what I was doing was wrong. Um, and honestly, I hadn't had any labels. They were assuming, they were making assumptions about who I was before I said anything. Um, and deep down, my pastor cared about serving those people that made the complaints over myself. Um, he cared about making sure that they were comfortable in church instead of me and my sexuality. Um, instead of choosing me, he chose the majority in what they would say about my sexuality. Um, and he let them continue in their judgy ways and their judgmental awfulness. And instead of encouraging me to serve in a way that I found best fit me, instead of letting me sing in a way that I found comfortable and serving God in that area, he decided to keep me off stage and have me backstage and not on stage at all. Um, seeing my pastor turn me down and not letting me sing on stage and worship in a way that I found fit was really hard for me as a 13-year-old at the time. I was really young experiencing all of this. Um, and he was somebody that watched me grow up. We came to church when I was born, and I, like, what was it, three days afterwards I was born, we came into church, right? And he, everyone in that church watched me grow up, and Throughout all of that, having that judgment still happen was really hard for me. Um, and so, regardless, I sang on my church's stage one time, and I really loved it and wanted to do it again. And I asked him to schedule me more often because I, it was something that I really would have a passion for. Um, and later on, the serving schedule came out for the next few months, and I looked at myself on stage singing and worshiping, and I was not scheduled once more ever again. He made me stay behind the scenes in the tech booth and wanted to hide the little gay kid in the back. Um, so that nobody could judge me and I couldn't be in association with him. That was really hard for me at the time because I was 13 and I wanted to serve on stage and sing my heart out, but the fact that I was gay and other people made assumptions about me was awful. I couldn't do what I loved to because people made assumptions about who I was. Um, I was not happy that this happened because at all in all, I expressed that I wanted to serve in a way that I felt comfortable in, but I was rejected because of the assumptions. Either way, my mom and I did decide to leave that church and because not going to church was better than going there. Eventually, we found one that we went to a few times, and we thought it would have been a perfect fit for us. Um, they had great music, they had the youngest techies, the beliefs, I thought they liked with my own. Um, and it overall seemed nice. And so a few weeks go by of us attending that, that church, and we, there was this one sermon, we sat in the front row, because that was only something that was open at the time. And the pastor began the message as normal, and I loved the, I loved the messages. They seemed very youthful, and it was great. But then they all begin to go into a depth about how it's wrong to be LGBTQI and how those people are not God's people. And in my mind, that just, I love that church. It was really, I connected with everyone there. Everyone knew me for the most part. It was nice. But they began to talk about how it was wrong to be LGBTQI. And so I remember whispering to my mom, we're going to dramatic with you. So. <laughs> So I picked up my pink 
little tote bag, and we got up from the front row, and we left. And we muddle strutted down that runway. Because at that point, having those people judge me, I was in nothing to get. Went there for a few weeks, I could get over it. Um, also, keep in mind, I was like 14, 13 at that time, right? So, we strutted down that sanctuary aisle and out that door to the church. Um, because at that point, enough people had judged me on this earth that I don't care what anyone thinks of me. All I care is that God loves me and that I'm serving Him to some capacity. So, we continued to look for churches weeks after that. And I almost gave up at that point. But it was just, it was very hard for me at the time because I wanted to find a church nearby that I could be in and feel comfortable with. And it was very difficult. Um, there are so many people on this earth, and God cares about each and every single person. In Jeremiah 31 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. I don't know how you interpret that yourself, but how I see it, God loved us and created us with love so we can spread it. So if he created us with all this love, how, why are we not spreading that as much as we can? Why are we stopping it with discrimination and other things? It's really hard for me to spread that when I've been discriminated against so many other times in my life. Um, and I fully believe that there is too much hate in this world to, to turn loving people away from God. Constantly, he communicates his undying love for everyone on this earth and for anyone who discriminates against each other because of something as simple as self-expression or who I choose to love is wrong in my eyes. Um, I was 13 years old when I was turned away from my church because I was a little gay closet boy that wanted to sing his part out. Attending that church, I attended it for years, and it hurt me and my entire family to leave. Not only did we know almost everyone in that church, but we knew their families, we knew their families' families, we knew their pasts. We were very involved and rooted in that church. It was so hard to leave. We built connections, and we had a solid foundation there. My mom worked there, my dad worked there, but they, we were all so involved. And we spread God's love for 13, I think, years of that church. Um, and we just worked so hard to keep it running, and it was all just stripped away within a matter of weeks because I wanted to do something, and it was seen as wrong. Um, and I just remember going to previous churches, and I almost gave up looking for one. I figured I would have had to wait until after I had, like, graduated from high school and leave to find a church that I feel comfortable in and to find a new Christian home. And I remember last May, uh, 2022, my mom told me that we had one more church that we'd have to try. And it was on a Sunday morning in mid-May, we walked into this stretch church, and we were greeted by like six different people. And I remember hearing the music start, and it was so great. And then the sermon started, and Rebecca talked about how next month we had a pride series. And I whispered to my mom, and we made eye contact about something about how this place is going to be in for the next long time. Um, and it was truly the light at the end of our tunnels. I almost gave up on looking for a church for now until I leave high school and until we found friends. It was really a light for us. Um, we were showing that God has faith and that if you just stick through it, you will be fine. Um, I'm just so glad that I take the journey that I've been on and that I ended up here. Because throughout all of that hate and all of that that has happened to me in the youth group and in church and in other things in school, but getting bullied and everything, I still, throughout all of that, I'm here today and I'm in front of this church speaking to the people that I love so much. And I'm really glad that I'm here because I don't know where I would be without friends at this point. Um, and so I'd like to talk about threats at home. It's been a long and hard fight to be here, but being here every Sunday is most definitely worth it. And I thank you guys for being here for me every Sunday. Um, it's been great, and I can't wait to continue my journey here. I'm going to pass it back on to Rebecca so she can continue with the rest of today's message. But thank you so much for letting me share my story and meet the world. I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank you.
came here to Threads, and I pray that we would prove to be um, a safe and life-giving community for them and for others whose stories involve rejection and hurt from the faith communities, Lord. And God, you are the God of redemption and um, the God who draws people to you. So Lord, I pray for everyone and, and for the communities that this story has touched on, that you would continue to be at work in um, those individuals and those church communities, um, bringing um, growth toward acceptance and um, repentance for past harm toward your LGBTQIA children, Lord. Um, we pray that, that all those people, that their story would not be mine either, and that they would continue to, to grow um, toward you, Jesus, and toward your likeness. And Father, pray for healing for Elijah and for um, others among us and others um, in our community who have experienced rejection, um, you know, like Elijah was sharing even when he was 12 and 13 before he even had put any labels on himself and was um, experiencing um, judgment. Lord, I just pray for those in our midst who um, have, have had uh, similar experiences. Lord, I pray for healing. I pray for restoration. I pray for hope. I pray um, for a new community and new connections that are safe and wholesome that give full opportunity to love you and serve you in the fullness of who, who you've created your children to be. And so, Lord, our heart this morning is for gratitude and thanksgiving for the just the full um, gift of the people that you have created and all the richness of their uh, identity and ask that you would raise up more and more people in your kingdom who um, to break the bounds of our constricted sense of who's um, of, of what we used to or what we have experienced, but that we would just um, be a colorful and vibrant and playful and expressive community that creates space for people to be who they are um, in service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Elijah. Thank you. such a gift when someone is willing to share uh, publicly like that. So um, our spiritual talk this morning is going to be a little bit shorter, uh, but I want to chat for a few minutes. We are starting a new series of talks this morning, and we're going to have a couple of shorter series through the summer. So this first series is um, called Habits of the Heart, and it's three talks that are going to be rooted in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, um, and I'm taking my inspiration for this series from a book by Alan Davis called Getting Involved with God, um, and I commend that book to you. It's um, I, for a while, was reading it, reading portions of it out loud at the dinner table, and one of my, um, one of my boys said, she's sassy. <laughs> about the author and her, like, kind of, her tone. Um, it, it's very engaging reading. I actually uh, found her email and emailed her that. I thought she would appreciate hearing that a 10-year-old about her, her uh, you know, high-level biblical scholarship was sassy. And, and she did get it about that. So, so we're going to be taking three weeks here to talk about that. Then we're going to have a spiritual talk series about uh, mental health and the life of faith. And then after that, um, we'll be going through, we'll be coming back to the Old Testament 
and um, going through the minor prophets, which are a part of the Bible that uh, sometimes don't get a lot of attention, but have real nuggets of, um, of God's voice uh, in really powerful ways. So I'm excited about what we have coming down the pipe. But this morning, um, we're going to talk about, um, well, anyway. Let's read the passage first, and then I'll introduce it. So we're going to read from Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 through 23. So I would welcome you to read along with me, if you'd like, or to just listen. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my, my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back but my face must not be seen. Let's pray. Lord God, we ask that your spirit would move among us, would speak to our hearts, that you would encourage us and strengthen us as we listen over the next few weeks to um, the ancient words of the Old Testament and the stories that witnessed your involvement your intimate involvement with your people through the ages. And I pray that as we hear these words, um, you would speak to our hearts about your presence with us and your involvement with us, your call um, to keep our hearts open to being called to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm getting over a, a long Cold, so my voice is a little, mm, little wobbly this morning. So um, I thought about asking for a show of hands this morning, and I'm not. You don't have to raise your hand, but I thought about asking for a show of hands as to how many of you feel maybe kind of a tightening in your gut, or a, a, a sense of rising anxiety, or maybe just like you're getting ready to kind of tune out, knowing that we're going to be talking about the Old Testament. I have a feeling that that is a, a, a live reality for a number of us. Um, the Bible is complicated territory for many of us. Some of us come from religious backgrounds where the Bible is treated as literally true in every respect. Every word is to be taken at, at face value as immediately applicable to our own lives. For some of us, the Bible is used as a um, a weapon or a, a tool kind of used against you by people in the back in the past to kind of wield um, power over you or to try to form you into a kind of constrictive mold. So when the Bible is treated like that, the Old Testament is a really scary place. Uh, at least in the New Testament, right, we have Jesus and Jesus' message of love and Jesus' surprising acts of of inclusion and grace, but the Old Testament has things in it like instructions for rebellious youth to be stoned to death, 
Uh, the Old Testament shows us a God who commands the slaughter of all living things um, in certain uh, places or among certain people groups in lands that Israel was called to conquer and inhabit. Uh, the Old Testament shows us a God who is so enraged by sin that God sends a catastrophic flood to wipe out every living thing on the face of the earth, um, except for you know, one righteous man, his family, and two of every kind of animal. So it's no wonder that some of us feel either traumatized or perplexed or offended by the Old Testament, by the Hebrew Bible. Let's just, you know, forget about that and hang out with Jesus and his message of love, right? That's a tempting, that's a tempting option. But the thing is, the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, um, it was Jesus' Bible. Jesus knew the Old Testament. He was, he, he was immersed in it. He loved it. He taught from it. And Jesus made it clear in his own teaching that we're not to just toss it. But that wasn't, in fact, what he was doing. He wasn't abolishing it, he was fulfilling it, right? So the story of Jesus isn't like a new religion, right? That Jesus is often referred to as the founder, especially if you hear people who aren't people of faith kind of talking about religions, right? They say, well, Jesus is the founder of Christianity. But Jesus wasn't the founder of a new religion. Jesus was a Jewish man immersed in the Jewish Hebrew scriptures and um, the story of all of us who call ourselves by Jesus' name is that it's a continuation of that ancient story of the people of Israel. We are grafted in to that ancient tree um, of God's people in the most ancient stories like the one that we just read from today from the book of Exodus. So wisdom says, listen to the Hebrew Bible. The Holy Spirit says, pay attention to the Old Testament. As ancient and perplexing and even offensive as it can be, it is a collection of writings that does not speak in a unified voice, but that does show us ways that God was involved with God's people throughout the story of throughout the history of the world. The Old Testament shows us a God who does not stand afar off, but who gets deeply involved in the mess of the lives of, of mortal human beings. The Old Testament shows us a God who draws near, who reveals the divine heart, and a God who makes himself vulnerable and tender for the sake of connection with um, the people that God loves. So this morning, in that context of looking at the Old Testament um, as a witness to God's involvement with God's people, we come to Exodus 33. And the book of Exodus, as you likely know, is the story of God bringing God's people out of slavery in Egypt through the wilderness toward the promised land. God um, kind of cements and defines God's special relationship with the people of Israel through the giving of the law. Um, God provides for the people in the wilderness through manna and quail and, you know, water from a rock. Through the leadership of figures like Moses and his brother Aaron, and through covenant. So the story of, of um, Exodus is long and action-packed, and by the time we get to chapter 33, a lot has happened. Israel has left the very brief post-Egypt honeymoon phase, <laughs> and they are on the spiritual struggle bus out in the wilderness. So in our reading today, Moses is up on the mountain talking to God. And he's actually spent a lot of time up there already. Um, he received the law, lots of important instructions for God, you know, the famous Ten Commandments. 
um, kind of chiseled out on, on stone tablets, right? Um, and so then Moses had gone down the mountain to present all of this to the people, and lo and behold, when he got down there, he found that they had gotten tired of waiting for Moses and for God, and um, Moses' more charismatic brother, Aaron, um, had, in the words of um, King Bowler, he, Aaron had engaged in some spiritual improvisation and had crafted a golden calf for the people to worship uh, because God and Moses were MIA. So many of us know how the rest of that story goes. God and Moses both were enraged at this um, impatient idolatry and um, you know, God was deeply offended to discover this quick transition that people made uh, from trusting God to idol worship, this unwillingness on the people's heart to just sit in the discomfort of a season of not knowing, um, their unwillingness to hang in there and trust. Uh, they weren't willing to do that, and it broke God's heart. So after some drama around that whole episode, back up the mountain, Moses goes to meet further with God, um, and God's anger is burning against this idolatrous people. But Moses begs God to forgive them. So God tells Moses finally, all right, go ahead, lead this people, go ahead, possess, possess the promised land, the land I've given you, but I'm not going to go with you. I can't be near this people because I might destroy them if I get close to them. Because you're a stiff-necked people, that's what God said. Um, I'm, I'll send an angel ahead of you to the promised land, but I'm not going with you. So that's where our story picks up today. We might imagine that at this point Moses would take what he could get, right? Things had not gone according to plan. The people shows the shocking lack of gratitude to God. Um, and uh, maybe Moses, maybe we think Moses would just grasp at whatever, you know, lifeline God would throw out. Okay, God's not going to totally destroy us, but at least he's going to send an angel ahead of us, right? I mean, I would imagine right now, if any of us are looking at some huge unknown in our future, and God's going to tell us, he's going to send an angel ahead of us, that seems like, <laughs> that, that sounds like that, like, you know, an angel might come in here, these way, like the rain. Um, so, if Moses' chief ambition was to establish a name for the people of Israel, to enter the Promised Land, to leave his own mark on history as a great leader, then you'd think maybe he would take this offer. Uh, he'd be grateful God didn't completely obliterate them, and, you know, maybe would express some gratitude for this renewed opportunity to uh, leave his mark on history, to realize his dreams for his people. But that was not Moses' response. Moses was not having it. So he put his foot down. He says to God, I am not going. I am not leading these people anywhere unless you go with me. I'm not going without your presence. And I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but in Hebrew, there is no, it never, there's no word for God's presence. It's God's face. If your face does not go before us, if we can't stand before your face, we're not going. So then, you know, God responds and says, okay, I'll go with you. And Moses is like, no, for real. Like, he, he repeats himself. Uh, I, you know, don't set this out from here unless you're going with us. Which, they're in the wilderness, right? I mean, you'd think anywhere would be better than here. But Moses, it sounds like he's willing to just have them perish in the wilderness than to go any further without God's presence with them. So Moses' whole focus is different than the rest of the people down at the foot of the mountain. The people that made the golden calf, they wanted results more than they wanted relationship. So they're, they're thinking, let's, let's get moving with this work of being a nation, of possessing the land, of finding some way to grab a hold of divine blessing by hook or by crook. And if this is a familiar impulse, it's easy to kind of judge uh, the people of 
Israel, Moses had the advantage of having drawn near to God before. He had had a taste of God's glory um, that, you know, changed him. It, it, it whet his appetite, appetite for God. People um, maybe were, didn't know God very well yet. So human beings in general were not good at waiting. They were not good at waiting. We're not good at just sitting with uncertainty. We are inclined to take matters into our own hands. But Moses behaves in an opposite manner. He's not willing to move forward with any of the work of going about what he sees to be God's business without centering relationship with God himself. Moses' priority is having the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with them. He's not going to settle for a representative. So God agrees, you know, to go with the people, even though he had just been so angry. And then Moses presses in it even further. He, um, you know, the promise that God will go with them and lead them isn't enough. Moses says, now show me your glory. Moses only has eyes for his beloved. He longs to see God's glory. He knows that intimate encounter with the living God is all that will really sustain him. Like many of us here, Moses has no deep suffering. He's experienced disillusionment and burnout and disappointment. In fact, um, Alan Davis says this story is the first documented case of pastoral burnout, right? And Moses is like, these are your, I'm not going anywhere without, without you. So Moses has laid down all of his hopes and plans, all any ambition he may have had, any striving, um, any optimism, right? He's laid it all down. His request is to see the beauty of the glory of the Lord. And God falls for this request. God, God is a sucker for, for our longing for intimacy, right? Because God longs to connect with us as well. So I, I feel like everything kind of stops in this passage. Time stands still. The people down below, the work ahead of them in uh, possessing the land, you know, the re-carving um, of the law on new tablets, all of that, all of that doesn't matter right now. Moses lets go of all of it. He's ready to relinquish it all. All that matters is God and Moses together, seeing and being seen, knowing and being known. Going in intimacy and like secure attachment, right? Like God and Moses, just Moses knowing that no matter what happens, he's safe in God's presence. So Moses is fearless in this passage, bold and audacious, even kind of demanding toward God, right? Sort of arguing with God. Um, but it's all for the sake of love, it's in the pursuit of of relationship, and God is, is there for it. God forgets his anger, turns toward Moses in love. So I think that Moses' requests of God here are interesting because the first request is practical. Go with us. Don't, don't send a representative. We need you to go with us. But the second request is just about Moses and his heart with God. It's, it, he just wants to see God's glory. It's just the entreaty of love. He's tasted God's glory. He knows nothing else matters more than just being soaking in the presence of the divine. We live in a world that's kind of obsessed with leadership and achievement, right? If you go to any bookstore, there's like a million books on leadership strategies and things like that. And our default, whether it's in leadership or our own pursuit of our goals, is to be like Aaron, right? To, um, to take things in our own hands, to push things forward, um, 
to make things happen. We muster up all of our skills and our charm and our charisma to make things happen. And that kind of attitude toward life is really highly rewarded in a capitalist society that really loves, um, you know, the harder you work, the more you're um, rewarded. And there's nothing wrong with taking action, right, or being a, an assertive person or any of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But as followers of Christ, as Jesus' people, as the people of God, what God is calling us to is what Moses does here. When our hearts know that we're like getting out in front of where the Spirit is, we're getting out in front of experiencing the nearness of God, just let, let the tasks wait. Set the ambition aside. Forget the promised land of God's not going ahead of us there. Seek for God's glory and only go where God is leading the way. But that's easier said than done, right? That, that sounds biblical, but it also sounds hard to do. So what does that look like in, in real life? Um, well, Jesus gives us some clues, and he speaks of this really clearly in Matthew 11. So we had a teaching team yesterday, and Adrian brought this passage up, and um, I, this is just one of my favorite passages in the message translation of the Bible. I'm going to read it from the message. Jesus says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And I think it's really interesting that if you look back at Exodus 33, um, God says in verse 14, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. When we were chatting in, in teaching team yesterday, we talked about the fact that that rest piece feels kind of random here. Like, that's kind of interesting that God talks about rest, um, but it makes so much sense that it's when we're prioritizing that connection um, with the heart of God that we can go forward into what God has called us to from a place of rest and not from a place of frenetic striving. So, at a very practical level, I would just challenge you this week to maybe look for, similar to what I said to the kids, look for maybe just, if, if spending time in the quiet with God is a part of your regular routine, maybe look for just two minutes, three minutes, where you can just sit in the quiet, just present yourself before the throne of God, and just ask the Holy Spirit to be present. A lot of times we as Christians have been trained to pray in ways that use lots of words, making a lot of requests. Um, and I think that sometimes it's just really good for our spirits to just sit with God and say, show me your glory. Just draw me near. skipping ahead a little bit. I'm just looking back to my notes because I feel like there's there's something else that I wanted to say. I guess at the heart of it, it's just that Jesus modeled this, right? Jesus wasn't inactive, right? Jesus poured himself out for the sake of um, his people. Jesus we see Jesus ministering and healing um, and being present with people. And we know he was fatigued. I mean, he, um, he gave up himself generously. But at the same time, you see Jesus getting alone with God, spending time in the quiet, retreating um, to connect with God's glory. So as a pastor, my heart then, when we think about what it means to be in church together, 
together, my prayer for all of you is to prioritize this audacious quest for connection with God and for God's presence over and above any service or work that you perform in the context of, of being part of the church. So yes, we need people to help in kids' community. We need people to join different ministry teams. But I'm talking to so many people these days who are coming to me in a place of just exhaustion, uh, who, who say, like, I've been in church my whole life and I am so burnt out. And that is just not... That's not what I want for you. I want for you to be able to be in that place with God where you say, show me your glory. And, and that when you come here together, that that's what we're seeking together. So may we all say, like Moses, we're just not going to do it. We're not going to do the ministry stuff. We're not going to go forward if God's not going ahead of us. We're not going to come down the mountain into the trenches of service and leadership and still. God is leading the way until God has given us a taste of God's glory. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are called to us as a call into rest, a call into intimate connection, a call into the beauty of your glory. Lord, for many of us, um, that's not what we've experienced. And uh, we haven't experienced it often enough. Lord, we, we are swimming in the ocean of our culture that is rooted in scarcity, is rooted in pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and, and making things happen uh, to the point of exhaustion and burnout. And Lord, we as your people want to say we, we want to do things differently. We want to, um, to just stay with you and not to not press ahead when you're not going ahead of us. And so we ask that as individuals and as a community, um, you would form us in that way. In the way of Jesus, the way of the, the light burden and the easy yoke and the unforced rhythms of grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we turn toward Jesus in a time of communion response, this is an opportunity to dive head first right into the, the nourishing experience of God's willingness to draw near to us, um, to be present to us, to show us God's glory in the person of Jesus Christ. The author of the book of Hebrews uh, tells us that um, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. And in John 14, Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So, and here's the amazing thing. When Jesus was preparing to go to the cross, he's about to be murdered by the same sinful human impulses that drove the Israelites at the foot of the mountain to form a golden calf, uh, doing our own things in our own way. When Jesus was about to be murdered, he says in John 12, 33, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So Moses was hidden in a cleft of a rock, covered by God's hand, and given a glimpse, I don't know, like through the cracks, through God's fingers, of God's back. But we have the amazing privilege now of encountering the overwhelming glory of God in the person of Jesus, who somehow, whose glory was made most manifest in his death on the cross, in his self-sacrifice for us. In 2 Corinthians um, 4, 6, Paul says that we who belong to Jesus are enabled to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And that face is, is full of love, full of acceptance and healing and mercy. And that face turned toward the cross, turned toward death in order to break the power of sin and death over us. So when we come to the table and we partake the bread that signifies Jesus' body broken for us, when we drink of the cup that stands for Jesus' blood poured out for us, we are offered every week a new opportunity uh, to encounter the connection, a connection to this transformative 
to glory of God. We are reminded of and upheld in the promise that God gave to Moses on the mountain, that the presence of God, the very face of God that we see now in Christ, does go with us. Like we sang this morning, right? Beneath us, beside us, and behind us, and in front of us. It's available to us because of Jesus. And in the bread and in the cup, we get to taste the unforced rhythms of grace as God's drawing in to God's presence in Christ through the Spirit was accomplished for us on our behalf without us having to strive for it. So, this morning, let's do this together. Let's wait for God. Let's rest in the easy yoke and the light burn. And let's enter into the delight of the glory of God in the face of Christ. As we come forward, grab a piece of hand sanitizer, dip a piece of bread in the juice. We will we'll worship through music as we are taking communion. The plate um, and the other juice on that end are going to be very great for those who need that. So come to the table while things are now ready. Thank you. 